awesome. So today's topic is MVP and product iteration. And our agenda is we will be starting off with the usual 10 minute topic overview. Um, and we have a really wonderful guest today. Um, so we will be having the speaker session and then a Q&A for you guys to ask questions. Uh, lastly, we will be doing logistics um, as well as a discussion uh, with your project groups. All right, so let's begin. All right, so what is MVP? Well, that's minimum viable product and it's a product or service with the very basic functionality. Um, and it's basic enough to provide early customers with value. And the pro of having this um, concept is so that you can receive feedback from your early customers as soon as possible and improve your product. And in other words, it's the simplest thing you can do um, for your products um, so that they can test your assumptions. All right, so I love cars. So let's say that I want to manufacture a car. So what would be the process of developing the minimum viable product? Well, it would look something like this. So the entire purpose of a car is to be a vehicle um, and provide transportation. So we would start off with a skateboard and then maybe a scooter and then a bicycle, motorcycle and car. And if you see this above picture, it's just a tire and two tires, and that really doesn't provide the customer with the purpose that a car should. So the bottom portion is a good MVP, and the top portion is pretty bad. <laughs> and in another context, so if we're talking architecture, the left diagram would be an example of MVP um, because it's super simple, yet it gives the right idea to the end user who could be the city council or the government. And this is what the MVP will turn into over time. So just like I did last week, I want to do, give some examples of MVP um, at its best. So Dropbox's MVP was actually an explainer video and it was released before the founders even created the physical product. Um, so they didn't really have the infrastructure, the software or the hardware built. And this was very strategic on their end because they were able to see if the file syncing mechanism was something that customers wanted in the first place. And it definitely was what people wanted in the first place because they got 70,000 people on board and they received that um, amount of support overnight. So another example is Zappos, which is an online clothing and shoe retailer. And the founder, Nick, he created his MVP concept with zero inventory. And what he actually did was he went to his local Foot Locker store and he took pictures of different pairs of shoes and he went back home. And then as soon as a customer would order on his website, he would go back, he would physically pick up the product and deliver it to them. So he created this huge business having zero inventory. And he could tell that his MVP model was successful without having to spend much time or money. And the last example is Airbnb. And this one's one of my favorites because the founders, Brian and Joe, they took pictures of their property. So first of all, they were based in San Francisco and the rent is super high there. So they were having trouble um, paying their rent. So what they did is they took pictures of their property, they put it on their website. And a couple of days later, three, three people from a local um, conference, they were interested in paying money to rent this property. So this from the consumer experience, this is pretty good because the experience was a lot more complete than the actual product um, that was built. And one of my favorite quotes um, from the co-founder of LinkedIn um, is, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. 
So it's very important to just get the basic functionality going and then immediately go go to the customer and get your feedback and then make changes. So this, I guess you could say, is like the expectations versus reality of MVP. Um, as they say, the path to success is never really a straight line. And every time you change a prototype, it's formally called pivoting. So a startup has many pivots um, and it'll keep on going until the very end, until you have built a strong product. Um, yes. All right, so to sum things up, MVP is a process. And for all of my CS students out there, it's kind of like an infinite loop because it never ends. So the first step is to launch your MVP very quickly, you know, get the basic functionality going and then to find your initial customers. And you could do something like what Dropbox did with their um, video, or you could do something like Airbnb by just creating a basic website. Um, and after you get your initial customers, you would receive feedback and you would make changes to the product and then start back square one and keep making changes. So it's a really fun process because it's never ending. Um, and we have a quote here from the CEO at Y Combinator and, and you know, he's totally right. You should not fall in love with your MVP. You should hold on to the problem you're solving tightly um, as well as hold the customer tightly. Um, but really you should hold a solution you're building loosely. And on that note, um, what better way to learn about this than listening to someone who has used MVP um, so many times and has been there and done that. So Serena, it's um, your turn. Yes. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome our speaker for today's lecture, Robin Chase. And Robin is an author and a transportation entrepreneur. She is also a co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar, the largest car sharing company in the world. And was, um, and bus, bus, bus car, a peer-to-peer -peer sh car sharing service in France, and go local and online ride sharing community. She's also co-founder and executive chairman of Vianium, a vehicle communication company building the networking fabric for the internet of moving thing. And um, welcome, Robin. Hi. Um, we have to change that slide. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, so I wanted to, I'm laughing, I think Zipcar is a great example of an MVP and also a terrible example of an MVP. So I want to, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that everyone there knows what Zipcar is and does. Maybe in the chat, if you don't. You, um, okay, I'm going to assume that you know what it is. And what's really incredible is that um, it's 20 years old now, which is really just so crazily crazy. I had a darker hair when it started. So I want to put things into context for you guys. I wanted to start with back in 2000 when we launched, 25% of the people in Boston had a cell phone. It was definitely not smart. And 50% of the people had access to the internet and that was mostly at work. And here we were wanting to do car rental by the hour and by the day um, using online reservations. And I also wanna take you back, you know, this is pre Uber and Lyft, which are based on the business model that we put together and pre Airbnb, Brian Chesty talked to me when he launched his company, pre Lime and the 12 other scooter sharing and bike sharing and all those companies. And so the way that you could innovate on in transportation before was either you designed an entire car or you would maybe build a fancy bridge or a new subway. And so Zipcar was really the very first one mainstream company it was attempting to go mainstream and to apply to everybody that was building, that was innovating in the transportation space. So in the fall of 1999, this is just, uh, putting it in more context for you. My co-founder was the best, the mother of my 
six-year-old's best friend. And so just think about where you get ideas. Um, so she's German and she went to Berlin on vacation. And when she was in Berlin, she saw a shared car across the street. And she came back and said, we live in Cambridge, Massachusetts in Boston. She said, Robin, what do you think of this idea? And I joked that really there was this light bulb that went on over my head. And I thought, oh my God, that's what I personally want. I have these three kids, one car. I live in a dense urban area. I want a car sometimes, but I definitely don't want to have another one that I own and have to pay for. And this is what the internet is made for, sharing specific resources really easily among lots of people. And this is what wireless will make possible. So I really did have this light bulb. And I, and I, I want to say that ex services existed previously in Germany and one in Canada. And a couple of people had tried it, but they were very, very old school and low tech. So it was kind of this co op -y, Birkenstock wearing, very low tech thing. I went to Montreal and visited with a competitor who wasn't a competitor since I hadn't launched yet, but with someone who had done it. And just to set you up for how they used to do it, um, they had these really cute little mini metal safes and they had the car parked and on the tree next to the car or attached to the building was a little safe and you would be given the combination to the safe and you'd open it up like a school locker and you would open it up and inside the key, inside the safe would be the key to that car. And when you wanted to make a reservation, you would call them up and they had those big ledger books like you would see in, I don't know, some movie from the 40s or some crazy retro thing with every car, every car had a page and for every date. And so you mean, so there were these paper ledgers where you'd make the phone call that find the ledger that open to the day that see if, you know, the pencil in like a hair, hairdressing appointment. So it was all done in this very low tech, challenging way. And I would say it was kind of marketed very much like a co-op. So we had this idea and very quickly. And so I spent the fall writing this fall, writing a business plan. And I did my research and I quickly realized that it was a great idea and I didn't want to do a small startup and that I wanted to invest heavily in technology. And so I want to tell you, so we launched in June of 2000 and we launched, I incorporated in January of 2000 and we had, and I met with a co-founder of mine, another, I, sorry, let me just focus here. Um, I went to Sloan and one of my classmates was a new millionaire from a startup that she had done. So I decided that I would invite her over for dinner and say, tell me about running a startup. What do you think? What should I know? And she decided to invest $50,000. So I had $50,000 from my classmate that I got over the dinner table and it was like, yay, Yahoo. I like, I've, who thought that she would have um, been, been my first investor? So I had this $50,000 and we had to build everything back then from scratch. And so there was no um, Squarespace. There was no Stripe. There was no, it took me six months to persuade the bank to let me do online, um, on, online credit cards. Now we're getting to the MVP. For the website, there was a little calendar and it was a, it's a, it was a calendar for the one car because I bought a beta car and it was a calendar for this one car. And you would, you would kind of click in, did you want which day of the week, which time of day, and you would click in and that would be your reservation. What would happen when you made the reservation is we had one car. It was in front of my house here in Cambridge. So you would make your reservation by booking it and you would come to my house. You would walk up my backyard, up onto the porch, there was a couch on the porch. You had to lift up the pillow and under the pillow was a car key. You went back to the car and in the glove box was forms that I had put in and you would fill in stop odometer, start, you know, start odometer, stop odometer reading, start time, stop time. And you would drive however you wanted, drive back to in front of my house, park the car, walk up the yard, put the key back under the pillow. And we did that for the first month. And that really was a minimum viable product. And what we found was that these 22 people who had signed up, loved the service. We didn't have to talk to anybody. I mean, the thing, when you're doing these startups and when you're doing minimum viable product, you want to figure out what is it 
that you're trying to understand. And I knew I was trying to prove to investors and to myself that one, people wanted a car by the hour and by the day, and two, that they didn't need to have any human to interact with. And so those were the things I was really trying to figure out. Um, coming back a little bit to just the name of the company, I, um, I tell you, even back in 2000, all the good names were taken. And it became this joke that I would be at register.com, I would type in a name and it'd be taken, taken, taken. And um, I had three children at the time who were six, nine, and 12. And I was joking with them inappropriately that penisbreath.com, taken. Like everything was taken, but Zipcar was not taken. And we came up with these five names that we thought were potential names. And I wrote them on three by five cards. And I had the name, one name of each, each name on a card and then a tagline on a card. And I, as I walked down the street, as I went food shopping, as I went store shopping, as I went to my kids' sports, as I moved around my environment, I would stop and ask people and say, hey, can I ask you a question? Which of these names, what does this name mean to you? And I would hold up the names and then they would tell me, I'd write on the back what they say. And they say, okay, and of these taglines, what do these taglines mean to you? And I would write it down. And I read, made very sure that I was not talking to people who were like me. So as I say, I would, whoever was in, I live in a downtown area and I would ask people who were not like me, who were not white, who were not women, who were not 40, who would not, I could ask all kinds of people because I wanted all kinds of experiences. And what I learned was any name that had the word share in it, people would say things like crummy, dirty, I'll have to wait, hippie. And so about 40% of the people did not like the word share. And this is before Facebook reinvented the word sharing. And so what I realized was a name that I had wanted to buy from someone called US Car Share was, no, I didn't want to use the name share. I didn't have to pay by that name. And then we had, there was a name that we quite liked, which was wheel share. And people heard the name word wheelchair. So wheel share went out, but Zipcar was all the things you want to think about. It was fast. It was, it was, it was fast. It was intriguing. It was easy to say, easy to pronounce and wheels when you want them became the tagline that people liked. So I'd say my, my marketing method and my beta testing was really, really low. And then I had a couple of focus groups at my house and they were slightly people that I knew and it was friends of people that I knew. So I had two focus groups of 10 people in my house before we went and launched the product. Um, and then one more crazy early detail was that I, um, went and talked with people who did marketing and I thought were well, marketing experts. And they told me that I had to definitely decide whether Zipcar was going to be for personal use or whether it was gonna be for business use. And I believed and I knew that, no, this is for everybody to use and who doesn't wanna have easy, convenient access to the car. And I don't wanna choose between whether it's gonna be personal use or business use and specifically, this business will only work if you get a diversity of users using, a di using the car at different times of day and different days of the week. And so I knew I had to have a diversity of users. So I went very counter to what all the marketing people were telling me that I had to specifically choose exactly who my target audience was. And I said, yeah, my target audience is everyone. And we put, um, I'm just trying to think of these MVPs. Sometimes when I give talks to um, entrepreneurs, I, one of my, one of the things I want to say is everyone is your free consultant. Like, so when you talk to your mom and she doesn't get it, instead of thinking, oh my God, you're so dumb. Why don't you figure this out? You should look at yourself and say, say, oh, I didn't explain it well. Like all the, all the things that you're thinking people should get or should know every feedback you get in your personal life or when you're giving presentations or when you're talking to your peers, when they don't get something, take that really seriously. Like that's serious feedback, it's free. <laughs> um, so in terms of MVP, it's really important. So we put the stickers for the car on the passenger side door and on the bumper. And again, my marketing friend said, you are crazy. People are gonna feel like they're driving around in some pizza delivery truck. They're never gonna wanna have, no one's gonna wanna have a sticker of your 
drive with a sticker of the car on it. And I thought two things. Thing number one, no, we're going to make this a really cool brand where you're urban, cool, hip, and in the know. And when you drive this, you're just way smarter and cleverer than anyone else. So you would happy to be associated. And two, I'm putting it on the passenger side door because when you as a driver get in and out of the driver's side, you're never going to see it. And so I was thinking of my own personal life experience when my husband and I had a, our first car and the window was broken on one side and my passenger side and it wasn't broken on his side. And so he didn't fix it for months and months because it never bothered him. And so I just want to say you bring all of your life's experience into these minimum viable products. So we had this first car and I want to add one more thing. You'll remember that Steve Jobs famously said, you can't ask people what they want because they would never have thought of this. And I think that statement is very true for the original idea of things that are very innovative. And I would say Zipcar was a very, very innovative idea. The idea of talking to the to people on the street and saying, hey, you know what? I want 40% of you guys, I want you to sell your personal car and I want, I'm gonna park a car in the neighborhood and you're gonna use it. And there's gonna be enough cars in the neighborhood that you're always gonna have it there for you. That would never have worked because no one could have imagined cars by the hour and by the day. And no one could imagine what it would cost to have a car by the hour. And no one could imagine that it would take you 15 seconds to get in and out of it. Like they just, they could not wrap their head around that. So I want to say the original idea of making a reservation online, having zero touch, having it take you 30 seconds to do the entire transaction for it to be really seamless and convenient way back in 2000, you know, 15 years before Uber ever thought of it. We leveraged technology to make it really easy and convenient. And so we did listen. So we had this idea and then we launched the service. So let me tell you some ways where it really, my original ideas failed. So we launched with a total of like $75,000 and we launched uh, having raised only $75,000. We launched with four cars and we had them parked throughout the city of Cambridge. And my idea, and I was starting to raise money seriously because now I had customers and I could have this proof point, look, people are using the cars. It's, it's, it's great. You don't have to have someone intervening between it. People can get it and do it without any challenge. But in my mind, I had always imagined that you're going to get in the car and there would be a device in the car where you would like put in your pin number and you would say, is the car in good condition? And you say, yes. And I want to extend the reservation or, you know, the car is dirty. I thought that I wanted this device in the car. And this is before cell phones. And so with my remaining like $15,000, I hired these two guys in, in these early months and they spent like six weeks to create this device that went in the car. And I feel like I want you to think of some, when I went to see it, see this device that was my last dime that I had put in, it was like my biggest outlay to date was on this crazy device. When it got, when it was there, it was this crazy big giant honking thing. It was hard to manufacture because it was military grade. Anything that goes into a car gets really, really hot or really, really cold. So it has to withstand all these terrible pressures. And, and it was, it was this miserable thing that when the sunlight shone on it, you couldn't see, you couldn't see the things. And within two weeks and people would call up and say, it doesn't work. I can't see what it says. It's like flying around the car. So this thing that I had beloved, that I had paid so much money to put together, I yanked out of the car. I said, nope, from now on, we're gonna have absolutely nothing in the car. You can do it in and out. It's gonna be simple. And I just look at my questions here. None of these are addressed to me. <laughs> um, so that was something that I had to give up and broke my heart, but I did it pretty fast. It was like a couple of weeks. It was causing these huge customer service issues. And, and I would say to date, even car sharing companies around the world up to this moment are still using annoying, asking users way too much information. And Zipcar is by far the simplest, fastest way to get in and out of cars. And we just really looked at 
what it was that people wanted. So once we had launched the service, we listened really, really closely. And I'm feeling like I want to give you guys time to ask some questions. There's one other piece that I feel like for all MVPs, the key, absolute top key way to succeed at this is, yeah, number one, touch your customer apps as fast as you can. And then number two, exercise what I think of as intellectual honesty, that entrepreneurs are in this mode of making everything seem great. My idea is great. The customers are great. It's working great. Please sell things to me. You know, please work for me, even though I have no money. It's going to do well. It's going to, it's going to be fantastic. You know, sell me stuff, even though maybe I'm not going to be able to pay you back because it's going to be such a great product. Like you're constantly in this sales, sales, sales pitch. But you, as the founder and as the person running this, you really, really have to pay attention to what is not working and getting at that as fast as you can and changing it. I think the difference between big companies and small companies is that companies can be really nimble and they can see changes, see problems and change them absolutely as fast as you can. And I would tell my employees, um, my staff, that there was, I didn't mind if they made a mistake because no one had ever done this before. We were really completely brand new. No one had done any of these things before. But what I minded is when we let the mistake go for a long time. And when you're paying really, really close attention. I mean, I would look at every single new customer, every use case, every single thing I could learn about it. I would find not only mistakes, but I would see opportunities. And I would say, oh my God, there's this whole market segment I never thought of, or there's this new, new demographic of users, or this particular location is doing really well. What can I learn about that? And so by paying really, really close attention and being ready to, as I say, to correct mistakes, as well as to leverage opportunities, that is how you succeed. And I'm just going to close before I go to answer questions to say I did many startups since then. And the very the startup I did right after Zipcar was called GoLoco. And that was a ride sharing company. So ride sharing company as in I have my car in three empty seats and I'm going from here to New York. Um, do you want to ride with me? When I launched that company, so I was, I was able to raise money much more easily than the first company because I had a company that was a great success and I was cutting edge and I said, okay, now's the time to do this company. Go local, people have smartphones, we had GPS, we have ratings of people, we have social networks now so people can know who people are, like I know all about this. And even though I had experienced doing a minimum viable product with my second company, I thought, man, I'm really smart. Now I know everything about this thing. And I spent $30,000 of my very first 50,000 that I raised hiring some very clever woman who worked for Google and was very impressive. And now she was freelancing, spent seven weeks doing this really, she and I probably had, we probably talked 20 hours a week for these seven weeks, getting this whole UI together and all this stuff. Because I had imagined that, oh yeah, people are going to want to make social networks. They're going to want to say, yeah, I like rock climbing and I want to learn how to speak French. And I, my car is shiny and new and has four seats or six seats. When we launched, people who want to share the ride don't want to say anything. They can barely even tell you the destination they're going to. Like all they want to type in is Manhattan. They don't want to say, here's where I am. They don't want to tell you how many seats they have. They don't want to tell you the car they're in. And so this beautiful UI that we had put done with this social network, it was like, no, I'm not going to put in one single piece of information more. So all of that got completely thrown out and we had to start from this brand new MVP and move up and build up again. And I just look at that and I think, how did I, how did I miss it? Like, how did I screw up? And because I hadn't recognized that I had built an MVP and launched, you know, with what I had done the first time around was because I had no money and no experience. And so I was really paying attention and easy to learn. You learn in the second one, I had money and I had experience. And so I overbuilt. So it's a, really the goal is to start with the absolute least you can. And you're always going to be thinking that you can't start that low. You're always going to think, no, but you know, you really need to have this kind of functionality in order for it to work. No, you can have Less and less and less functionality. One more story and then we'll do questions. So after we launched with these four cars, we put in a 
box inside the windshield like we have today and you could hold a card on that box and it would unlock the door. People thought, people thought that the car would open, that the right car would open at the right time to a person who had made a reservation on that car. What was happening in reality is if you owned that company's card, the, the manufacturer's card and you held it on the, on the windshield, it would unlock the door. It didn't matter who you, didn't matter who you were. If you just owned that company's card and put it on the windshield, they would unlock the door. And then the keys just like today were hanging around the steering column. And if you had seen those keys and broken into that car and stuck them in the car and started the car, it would have started. It was a complete black box that people believed the technology worked or they didn't see that cars were dang, the key, car keys were in the car because they'd never even imagined such a thing. And so for the first three months we operated and the first 20 cars we operated, it was a complete, there was no connection. The car was not connected to the internet. So we ran for these three months, people still filled out this form in the glove box, but they thought that they were only getting into the right car at the right time, having made the right reservation. But in fact, we didn't know. And at the end of every month, we had to scurry around to every car and open up all the glove boxes. And I personally had to enter in all the start time, stop time, started all this stuff and create bills and send them out to people. So we were the wizard behind the curtain. And so I feel like that's what needs to happen in the beginning is that you and your team and the people that are your friends and your who's helping you is the wizard behind the curtain before you spend money investing in new technologies that you're gonna to have to be building. So it was just this black box. And um, one of my board members had this great metaphor. Um, he said, everyone, he says, everyone talks about Zipcar all the time everywhere. He says, and, but he says, well, you know what? I know everyone thinks you're this amazing peacock with this beautiful plumage and you're like, just so gorgeous. He says, and I know you're an eight pound chicken. And really that was how um, Zipcar started and went was we, it was, and one more metaphor. <laughs> if, you, if you're in a hotel, you know, when you're at the hotel, everything is glossy and nice and it's beautiful and shining and clean. And then you open a door because you think it's a bathroom, you think it's going to a closet. In fact, it goes to the back of the hotel and it's like dusty, unswept, no paint, stuff stored in the junk area back. That's what it's like. In when you're doing MVP. On the front side, it's looking this glossy, kind of nice looking thing, but behind the scenes, it's complete garbage. It's complete garbage with people doing the heavy lifting. So my questions, do you guys have any questions? What else can I tell you? Yeah, thank you so much, Robin, for sharing your stories. I absolutely loved all of them. Um, everyone, please feel free to raise your hand um, or you can ask Robin a question in the chat. Uh, we have, yeah. Hi, Robin. Hi. I can't hear you. Mute. There we go. We good now? Awesome. Um, so I have a couple questions. So first of all, um, today I I'm kind of at a loss to find what the leading competitive advantage of Zipcar is against competitors like like Gig or Turo um, or any of these types of apps. Um, and secondly, this is relating more to the MVP type of process. Um, why is it a tendency, I guess, for 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 lack of better words, crappy UI UX designs um, for MVPs to succeed um, rather than rather than MVPs that are fully developed and integrated um, to tend to not necessarily tend to fail, but there is a high tendency for um, these types of MVPs to fail, as you mentioned um, earlier. I'll deal with the second half of your question before the first half. Um, because beautiful UI is what you, the founder, thought was interesting and not at all what the users thought was interesting or important or relevant. And so that is the whole name of the game. Like I thought, yeah, we should have this great little box inside the car and it should be and make it easy. And it's just like, no, they don't need any of that. They don't wanna do anything. They wanna make it dead simple. So, or, I mean, you learn as you go. 
So that's the whole point of an MVP is that you are one individual and you absolutely do not know what all of your, all the people out there and the range of the demographics. You can make great guesses and I can say, this is why I feel like Zipcar is almost kind of a crummy MVP because I was, I just moved houses and I found an executive summary from June of 2000. And I will tell you word for word what we launched with in June of 2000 is what you sing today, 20 years later, like exactly every word is the same, but the execution on that and how we got to this place um, took a lot of careful listening. So I, I, and there's also problems that you didn't think of um, when you think about UIs that you just, so to a zip car example, like how big should penalties be relative to the, what is the hourly rate of a car? How big should a penalty be for you leaving it dirty? When you get kicked out, why should you let someone in? What are the conditions under which you let, that, let people back in? So there's all these details that you can't understand or know that even exist until you have um, operationally run through it. And Turo and um, other companies, when I first launched Zipcar, there was this one incredibly annoying person who would send me these really long endless emails about why in heck did Zipcar not just use all the idle cars all around the world? Like, why would we ever get brand new cars? So number one, insurance. Turo, who I know very well, lied for the first three years, as did Lyft, as did Uber, that your own personal car insurance would no way in hell pay for you renting your car or using it for, for money. And they lied about that for the first three years. So when Zipcar launched, it was really hard to get insurance just in general for what we were doing. And that was with cars that we owned. And so those companies lied for the first three years. And what disturbs me about their lies is that these assets are the owner's second most expensive thing they own. And when they get crushed, that's really bad for them. And also they put people at risk. So now there is insurance. Um, and I would say, then I would go to technology. What was just it's incredible to me is that everyone is still getting this, except for Zipcar, which has this totally integrated, built from scratch system. Everyone else has got these patchwork things. They're using someone else's technology. The key exchange is a really huge deal. And Turo and Getaround, both of whom I know, they often way overstate the ability to use a smartphone to get into cars because every single vehicle for every, not only by brand, by vehicle type has different car locking mechanisms, car unlocking mechanisms. There are no standards across the industry and no standards even within company manufacturers themselves. So the idea that you can open up anybody's car using a phone app is a lie, just out and out lie. Um, and so that key exchange is onerous and hard. And the cars aren't always, I think, I mean, I am really supportive of the peer platform gig economy. And I know it intimately having tried to do a peer to peer car sharing company, Buzzcar, which um, I did in France because I could get insurance there. And it was, as I say, I couldn't get it here and people were lying and launching with no insurance and I wouldn't launch without insurance. So I know intimately how individuals interact and what we've learned about those companies, all gig economy companies, is that it's taken years for individuals to become uniformly of higher quality, that we aren't used to giving good customer service. We aren't used to responding quickly, having clean things, mm -hmm cleaning up after people, that there's a huge range of quality of the vehicles and the hosts or the people who are providing it. But over time, people become better at that. And that's why we have ratings. And I think it's something that can happen. So I'm not writing it off entirely, but it's a different level of quality and service, but there's place for both of them. So it was a really long answer. Someone else. Hi Robin, um, I'm Juliet, and first of all, thank you so much for being here. I've used Zipcar multiple times in the past and I love it. Um, so I'm really excited that you're here tonight. But my question is kind of off of what you said before about insurance. I'm kind of more interested in how that was factored into the MVP. 
Um, was it something that you had to work with insurances and try to convince them um, to work with you? Or was it something that you had to pay out of pocket? And how did that affect the MVP initially? That is a really good question. Thank you. Um, so part of what you're trying to prove out when you're doing your startup is that there's a business model and the business model will work. And something that took a lot of iterations, and I could be giving you stories about, about the, those iterations was pricing. And before I launched the company, I spent probably 30% of my time thinking about the pricing, what pricing I would launch at, what were the different variables, um, hourly, daily, per mile, per type of car, Another thing that people had been giving me huge recommendations were, oh, Robin, it's got to be a standard flat price. You know, every car is $10 an hour. And, and when I went to my visit, the guy in Montreal, um, what I learned is that he was under huge pressure around, around that. And so one of the things I came away with was I was going to price zip car like you would price an apartment. So is it a BMW parked in the fancy part of town or is it a... Toyota Corolla parked someplace else. Like people really understand that there's this price relationship. So getting to the insurance. As I was thinking about pricing, I needed to prove that we had a sustainable business model. Yet the pricing, getting that insurance was unbelievably hard because while there was insurance that existed for people driving fleet cars, those instances were employees of the company driving the employer's cars. And so there was this idea by insurers of insurers that you could twist your, your employees' arms. You could had more sway over them than we could have over our users. But we also worked closely with the insurer and said, okay, well, tell us ways that we can make you feel more comfortable about that. Um, and so that's where we came up with rules that if you'd had a moving violation in the last three years, you couldn't you couldn't become a member. Or we initially were, you had to be 21 or older and then that, because those were insurance led issues. But even with all those things, the initial insurance was incredibly high priced because they hadn't had much experience with it. And I feel like every startup I've ever done, because we were doing such novel companies, the insurance companies don't know how to price them. So they price them really, really high. So when I was pitching to my investors, I would say, okay, this insurance price is really out of whack. I think over time, it's going to come down. So I'm pricing the product to have the insurance price that I am anticipating, but I don't have that now. And so similarly with um, car costs that we, in the beginning, my first cars, we were paying just the price that you would pay right? I wasn't getting any break. And over time, that price went down. But so I had to make the pitch to my investors that A, insurance companies would learn and that our, our drivers weren't any worse than anybody else when I put these parameters on them. And that proved to be true. And, but it takes like three years for that to happen. And so similarly with Uber and Lyft, when they were lying about, their, about having insurance, it took them three years for insurers to witness what was happening and then to be able to give them a priced insurance, be willing to sell it to them. Yeah, so that insurance has been, when you're doing something that's really novel, that's been my biggest headache. Um, and I just have a really quick follow up to that. Um, so did you find it hard because of the insurance? Um, because it looks like it was kind of narrowing down your, your customer and who you were targeting because they had to be over 21 and had to have a good record. So how did you overcome that with time and, and what did you do? So a couple things and some of it is kind of funny that um, so that if you can't have had a moving violation for the last three years, well, there's two types of people who haven't had a moving violation in the last three years. One, good drivers. Two, people who never drive, who are not good drivers because they never drive. <laughs> um, the second, so I, I guess it just was, and then, and then um, for the, so I think even to this date, I think Zipcar does a 
background check on every person. And in the beginning, we had to pay someone to do that. And that would take up to a week and we would pay them like 15 bucks or something, something horrible and egregious and had to have a third party do it. And they would take a lot of time. And then as Zipcar volume grew, we went and did the licensing and the security business that you have to do in order to be able to verify someone's insurance records in real time in seconds. And so that's what happens. So we didn't have to, we stopped having to pay a third party to do it and we could do it in real time ourselves. But that was something that came with volume. Um, as to the age constraint, young drivers are terrible drivers. That's the truth because they are bad risk. They have bad risk assessment and they don't have, they lack experience. So we moved it from 21 to 18. Um, first, when we moved, we started making larger deals with universities. And so at universities, they wanted to have drivers who are 18, but we didn't want to take on that risk. So we worked with Wellesley College, I think was the person, was the school that made the breakthrough for us, where we, they looked in their own existing insurance that they were paying as a university for students to drive school vans places or for students to drive each other places. And so they already had an insurance on that. So for the 18 to 21 year olds at universities, it was now a layered insurance and the university took that piece of the risk and we took an additional risk, um, the risk on top of that. So I learned a lot about insurance over the time. And just that example, I wrote this book called Peers Inc. that if you're thinking of doing a startup, I would highly recommend. It's about it's Peers Inc, how people and platforms are building the new economy, reinventing capitalism. And one of the things I talk a lot about there is leveraging excess capacity. So finding something that is worth a huge amount to you that you don't have to pay for. And so that is in fact what Lyft and Uber were doing when they were using other people's cars. And that's what Turo and Get Around are doing. But in the case of insurance, that was how, when we were tapping into Wellesley to say, use your own insurance you've already paid for to insure the students that are driving our cars. And another simple example would be that when I first um, made my first deal with MIT, which was the first school that we worked with, they were giving me one parking space which is worth 150 bucks a month, that's fine. But much more interesting to me than that 150 bucks a month was that they now would do mailings to their 35,000 staff, faculty, and students mailing this, hey, there's this new service and there's parking on campus. And that was worth a huge amount to me and nothing to them. So again, for lots of, I, I wanna encourage you to be, when you're doing your MVP, to be thinking, where can I, leverage somebody else's asset, data, time of day, networks insurance um, that I don't have to pay for and that doesn't cost them anything, but worth a lot to me. That's great advice, thank you. Yeah, hi Robin, I'm Victor and I just hi. wanna thank you for your speech. So I wanna ask that if I want to have a startup but my idea is very generic, so not like when Facebook came out, but more like some features Facebook have that I don't like and I want to improve on them. So I guess, what, what do you think is important for those kind of startups and what advice would you give to them? So I feel even when I was doing, so when I was doing Zipcar and I wrote this story in the book, in those first days and months, I had this kind of daytime nightmare that I would be sleeping in my bed and the car rental companies would come with like machine guns and kill me in the bed, like in The Godfather. Like, I just thought, oh my God, I'm, a, I'm disrupting this entire industry and this entire sector. And how can I possibly imagine that I can accomplish that? Like, that's a crazy dream. And so I wanna go back to this idea that, that you think, how can I ever possibly go up against Facebook or how could I ever do that? I, but I want to say that is the standard, that's the standard way it happens is that there are these small ideas that are in fact, there are these small companies with good ideas that are, that are indeed useful and they are good ideas and customers do value them. And so you, you focus on, that's the other piece is you've got to be really focused on what it is 
that you are doing that is unique and valuable and be delivering that. And even as I say those things, technology has now come down to five gigantic monopolies who know everything about everyone and everywhere. Um, and I think it is really hard to compete with them. And I'm hoping that's, that things break up. So, I mean, if Amazon can see you buy every competitor's product, well, then they say that's a great product and I'm going to make it and they make it and they underprice you. Like there are these horrible, uncompetitive aspects to our current gigantic monopolies and the gigantic amount of, or Google, the amount of data that they know that are really, really hard to compete with someone who knows everything. Um, and so I don't have an answer for that. So maybe your thing is something that can go into the radar and your ultimate goal will be Facebook will buy me because that is what will happen. Those big companies, if you will prove to be successful because they aren't paying attention for a long time and then you produce something that people do like and do use, then they'll say, that's great. I'm seeing it now, I'm gonna buy it. But what we really do have to work on around the world is how to reintroduce more competition into the surveillance state and everyone knowing everything about every move that we make. It's very hard to compete. Uh, hi, Robin, I have a question. So what would you say is the best yardstick to measure the success of MEP as customer adoption may not be much for MEP? I guess uh, one of my, when I referenced my, my classmate who was the first person I knew who was a millionaire and who was one of my classmates and who was my first investor, she had said to me, Robin, every time you talk to an investor, you should write down their questions. And, and your job is to reduce risk. Like that is your job risk reduction, because every time you reduce risk, then you can raise more capital at a higher valuation. So the answer to that question is, I don't know what you're trying to accomplish. So for Zipcar, I profoundly needed to demonstrate that there was this demand for cars by the hour as well as by the day, and that we could fulfill that demand without having any humans involved. So I had to be really focused on that. When I would talk to investors or friends they always had a thousand great side ideas. Like, oh, you should be doing this thing. This and I'd think, or if you had all this marketing money, you know, what you do. And I think, no, what I need to prove, what I need to prove is that no one's gonna touch the car. There's gonna be no humans involved and that there's demand. And so for me, that is what I needed to prove. And curiously, when you're working with investors, um, so we, did Boston, it went gangbusters. We grew month over month, seven to like 22%, which at the time I thought was fantastic. It was really great growth every month, growing, growing, growing. Then when I went to raise more money, investors would say, and we had, I think in Boston, I want to say, I don't know, we had like 4,000 users or something. And investors, when I was raising capital, say, oh, but Robin, you know, they're clearly like, you must know them all. And so until you go into a second city, we're just gonna consider all those people your friends. And I think, what are you talking about? I mean, what are you, like the idea that I have 4,000 friends that are driving across Boston. And so, so I feel like you need to know your success relates to what is the risk that you need to be overcoming. So is it the number of users? Is it a piece of technology? Is it, some efficiency factor. I mean, it really depends what is the key novel risk that is preventing you from raising more capital to, to do what it is that you need to do to succeed. And even as I say those words, I wanna, I wanna say that if you could build your company without ever raising any money, that's the best kind of company to build. But technology-based companies typically require a lot of capital. Um, but uh, so I do want to say that success is not um, which VC you've raised money from and how much you raised. That's not success. Success is um, finding users who value things that you're 
that you're selling. All right, thank you, Robin. I have a couple of questions that people private messaged me in the chat. Uh, so the first one is, compared to Zipcar's initial idea, how much has it changed and did the core idea get changed or just the feature functionality? Um, nothing got changed. I'd say uh, my successor did one thing that I think has pros and cons and still not. So I charged, Zipcar initially charged people by the mile in addition to by the hour. And the advantages of that were, would be that if you use the car to drive to the movies, the two hours you're sitting and watching that movie, you would be paying a very low rate. And then, so there was this benefit to, to that, but the failure of that is that it's harder to communicate. Um, it's a harder messaging, marketing messaging. And so that was the one thing that, that um, he changed to make each individual car have its own unique all-in price. As, pr as gas prices have gone up and down, like also that's had challenges for the company and for users. But honestly, when I stumbled across this executive summary, I was completely shocked by how it has not changed one bit. And if we move forward these 20 years and think of um, things that have happened in those 20 years and other startups that have happened, I think there's been some missed opportunities to expand what the company offers and to transform this relationship that I think other people have stepped into that yes. space. But um, Zipcar never had to pivot. And I do believe that not owning personal cars is a serious part of the future. That the future, definitely in cities, people won't be owning their cars. It's just a crazy, stupid, fin financially stupid idea. Awesome, thank you. And I have another question from some in the chat. Do you have any insights on what transportation might look like in the next 10 to 20 years, especially with autonomous vehicles on the horizon? Ride sharing and AVs will reduce people who own cars, but won't necessarily decrease traffic or cars on the road. So are there- That was written by a person who actually knows something about transportation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so, name out the, so Nicholas. <laughs> All right. So, the, are there any? The future is, wait, let me just answer that question. The future yeah. is definitely multimodal, that we will be having all ways of getting around. The idea that every person who's an adult owns a car and uses that car to get every place is just completely incompatible with population densities, with household budgets with the way you actually want to move. And so um, a piece of work that I'm doing right now is, is elevating the need to have a, a net, make it, making it safe. Here, here's my new sentence. This is the same, when we talk about MVP, <laughs> I, uh, when I give talks or test ideas, I also listen really carefully for how quest, sentences res, and ideas resonate. And through Twitter, I found out that here's my good sentence. Um, over the last hundred years, we've made it safer to cross the ocean than to cross the street. And so cars have so dominated our landscapes and roads that they've made cities pretty much unlivable. And they've people, made people who live outside of cities completely dependent and trapped. And so we need to um, think about this. We need to elevate the ability to walk and ride your bike as just part of your normal everyday thing. But in any case, autonomous vehicles be part of it, transit part of it, walking, micromobility. I'm really big on electric bikes. All right. And the end of the question was, are there any interesting approaches to saving commute time? To saving commute time? Yeah. <laughs> the pandemic has demonstrated the most interesting approach, which is don't commute. Um, so that's going to have a very big uh, I do believe that will really change uh, the change how companies react in that in the pre-pandemic times, some companies and some bosses 
believed that everyone needed to come into work and they needed to see each other. And it turns out that actually only a fraction of people need to be present to do their jobs. And I think how that's going to play forward is that we'll have many jobs will remain uh, flexible. And so you'll come in every once in a while. So that would be the number one way to address commutes. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm really interested in electric bikes right now. And for those of you who haven't tried one, you should absolutely try, try one. They are world, they are life transforming. And um, the, what's interesting about commuting is that commuting is only about, is less than 20% of all trips that are done. And so 80% of our trips are not commute. And half of the trips that we do are less than three miles. And so there's a real, now we have electric bikes. You kind of feel like you're really nimble, you're fast, it's easy, you don't sweat. The weather is kind of irrelevant and they are cheaper, faster, more nimble. And I think there's a real place for that. And so I think that'll be also changing our commutes if we build the infrastructure that makes people feel safe, which is a really big issue. Yeah, great question. Um... I actually, I want to really try an electric bike now. So thank you for that. It's not on my bucket should. list. Should You should. You really feel it's so fun. <laughs> yes. So one more question that was PM'd to me is, what would be your advice for people when something doesn't work out? And at what point should someone pivot in their startup journey? Another excellent question. Um, when I started Zipcar, it was at this moment of tech boom and everyone was doing these high tech startups were you cool or not had you started a startup and and i had i was in this kind of cohort of people i was going to all these startup events boston was really hot there were these things all the time i was talking there was you know just all these meetings and startups and over the course of that year i alone stood among those companies that like I had these this cohort of 10 people that I would meet with like once a month we meet up for breakfast we would talk all the time and I was the one last standing and I remember listening to some people and their ideas and I would think your idea is so bad like that is a really stupid idea and and then it would take time and then they would fail <laughs> so coming back to this idea of intellectual honesty you really have to be paying attention. Is your idea a good idea? And, and is it your execution of the idea that makes it suck? Or is there, there's no demand for that idea? And you really have to be paying such close attention. And I wanna, um, Katarina Fake was a person who did Flickr founder and CEO of Flickr. And her story was that she was doing something totally different. I wish I could remember now. But she was down to like her last $48. And, it, and the thing that she was doing had many, many different components. And photo sharing, uploading photos and sharing them was one tiny, tiny piece of the components that she had. And she just thought, huh, let me see what happens if I know this one piece works, if I open it up and turn that into the idea. And she took her pitiful amount of money and this tiny, tiny idea that was one fraction of the whole thing and took it off in a wholly different direction. And Lyft, um, I would say, pivoted from, I said that I had done Go Loco. I was, my arch rivals in Go Loco was a company called Zimride, which were the two, ultimately two Lyft founders. And for several years, we battled it out. After two years, I decided there is no demand in the United States for ride sharing, as in person going from here to there with their own car with empty seats. There's no demand in this country. I gave half of my money back to investors. And then Zimride, my rivals, kept going for another four years. They couldn't make it work either, but they raised millions more, done, more dollars that they spent and couldn't make it work. They sold that, which was sold that for basically nothing. And they pivoted 
and said, oh, we're going to do taxis where you drive your own car instead of, so you're going to be the driver to go wherever someone wants rather than you're taking someone on your same route. So that was a pivot for them. And that was a really brilliant pivot. So it really just, I would say as fast success comes from recognizing the failure as fast as you can. And so for Go Loco, when I called it was, I did a conference that had all the, all the elements that would make ride sharing work and still no one wanted to do it. So it was a conference, a sustainability conference in California. And it was in the middle of California. It was like in San Francisco. And so people from all across California were coming to this conference and California is something is a very vertical state. So people are going on the same major routes up and down. And I had been heavily profiled as a keynote speaker. I had been in their newsletter before people came to the conference. And we said to people, here's the software, who wants to join? And out of the thousand attendees in this vertical state where I had been heavily profiled, that was all about sustainability. Two people signed up and those people were spouses. They were actually the same car, the same people going together. And so that's my thought, okay, all the systems are aligned. They've heard of me. They think I'm cool. They believe in sustainability. They're in a state where things are up and down. Parking is $20 a day at the conference and they still didn't want to go share a ride. I thought it's not going to work in this country. And it never has <laughs> in those intervening years. So I want to say it's terrible to call your company. You feel mortified. I would say that's probably, you feel really bad personally and you feel bad I gave money back to my investors, but I will say as the years have passed, my integrity has um, been polished by that move because I did the right thing, but it is a really, really hard call. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much, Robin. I know it's super late for you. You told us you're in a different time zone. So I think we'll wrap up our speakers. Um, right. But I want to thank everyone for the amazing questions and really wow, what a session. Thank you again for sharing your insights and as I like calling them golden nuggets. <laughs> okay. um, so yeah, thank you, Robin. And My pleasure and good luck, all of you guys. I'll say goodbye. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. All right, students, uh, before you head out, let me share my screen. We're almost done. We have. Um, a discussion so we will put you in your project groups and you can start working on next week's project assignment uh, so one second All right, uh, so Grace, would you like to, is Grace on the call? I know she had. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, so before we head out to our discussion session, just can, can everyone just please fill out the attendance check um, either by scanning the QR code or Rex or Serena, they will share, share the link in the chat. Um, I will wait a few minutes here just for everyone to fill out the attendance check. All right, hopefully people were able to get the passcode right. Um, if not, you can PM me and I will manually enter you as present. Um, so yes, let's move on um, to our next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just a few reminder that our idea spreadsheet and project assignment is due by tomorrow at 8 a.m. Just don't forget, uh, just don't forget um, to turn that in as that will be counted towards your final grade. Also, I have posted the recommended reading, so that will be in your weekly folder 
Uh, it's completely optional, but you are always encouraged to do the reading. Um, another few reminders. So for homework two and project assignment two, they were both due by the end of this week. So don't forget to turn these in uh, as we'll no longer extend the homework deadline. So for homework two, you will be asked to watch a video and answer the question. And for project assignment two, uh, in your team, you will be asked to answer two questions related to MVP. Remember, there is a fireside chat next Wednesday, February 10th from 7 to 8 p.m. PST time. So this time we invited the guest, Jimmy McGurk, who is the managing partner at Co2 Management and ex-operating partner at Andreessen Horowitz. So round, uh, round table application will also be open. So apply if you want to talk to face to face with Jimmy and the link we will also post it to PB courses. And now we will go head over to our discussion. So either you can get into your project groups or use this time to find a group as our project assignment will do tomorrow. And please check the spreadsheet which room you are in based on the project lead of each team. So for instance, if I'm in Peter's team, I will go into breakout room one. And for those of you who haven't found a team yet, either join a breakout room for people who have a star next to their name to see if they're looking for any other teammates, or you can join Breakout Room 17 and we will help you to find a team there. And PM Siri, if you have a star next to your name and you're not looking for more members or, or you need other adjustment. Awesome. Uh, Chris, can you please open up the Breakout Rooms? I'm going to yeah. do it right now. Okay. Okay. 